Your mission is to destroy every trace of something known only as Project Starfish. Starfish is a slang term for a butthole. Think there's any connection? We're all gonna die. I hope so. Welcome back everyone. This is gonna be my Suicide Squad movie review. What year is this? Is it 2021 or is it 2016? Also explain where this fits in the timeline, how it's connected to the events of the first Suicide Squad movie, because it isn't a reboot, but there is a lot of the cast from the first movie that came back for this. So I'll also explain how it connects to the other DCEU movies, the timeline of the Justice League Snyder Cut, all that stuff. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos. Once the movie does fully come out and gets released everywhere, I will do a full breakdown and Easter eggs video, post credit scene videos, all that stuff. Yes, there are two different post credit scenes, so make sure you stay through the entire credits. But overall, the movie is just a huge upgrade. You've probably been seeing most of the reactions going crazy over it. There's actually a lot of early screenings they've been trying to do for it, so there's a chance that you actually might be able to see it a couple days early for free. Overall, it was a very low bar that this movie had to clear in order to be better than the first movie. So even if it had just been an okay movie, it still would have been a big step up. The way they treat the continuity of the timeline, the idea is that this is just the next big threat that Amanda Waller has to deal with, and some of the members from that last team are either back in prison to be used again for the new mission like Captain Boomerang or Harley Quinn, or they're still working together like Rick Flagg, so it's just the next version of the team with a couple of survivors from the last team. Generally, I would say the events of the movie take place after the Justice League Snyder Cut and after the Birds of Prey movie. And in the way that everybody is supposed to be a bad guy during the Suicide Squad movies, like they're all either anti-heroes or really despicable villains. It's all just shades of different types of villains. There's a huge threat that Amanda Waller has to take care of, a big problem, and the idea is that the government, the US government, the military, is low-key kind of also responsible for creating the problem themselves in the first place. But a while ago, James Gunn was explaining how he wound up at DC making a movie after spending so much time at Marvel, and he said that they literally told him that he could do any movie that he wanted, with maybe the exception of Batman, because I think at that time they were still in the process of spinning up on the Matt Reeves Batman movie. But literally any characters that he wanted, any movie, any title that he wanted, he could do anything. The reason why he said he chose the Suicide Squad to do is one, because he had grown up a huge fan of the original John Ostrander run. And if you are a big comic book fan, you probably spotted him in a lot of the earlier trailers. John Ostrander got his own Stan Lee cameo style moment. He's the doctor in Bell Rev who implants all the exploding chips in the brains for Amanda Waller. But two, James Gunn also said that he felt like one of the biggest issues today with comic book movies, big superhero movies in general, is that most of the time it feels like there are no stakes. You always feel like the characters are wearing plot armor, they're never going to die because they can't die, they're the heroes. They kind of tried to buck that trend a little with Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame in the Marvel Universe. Not counting the characters that show up in alternate timelines, alternate realities. Everybody looking at Loki right now. All the Lokis. But the Suicide Squad, just as a story, as a property, was the perfect solution to that problem. It's literally built into the DNA of the story that a bunch of them always wind up getting killed off, often in hilarious and gruesome ways. They kind of tried to do that a little bit during the first movie, but I feel like this new Suicide Squad movie really delivers on that promise. Like DC says, oh, you can kill off any characters that you want, and James Gunn says, hold my beer. You may have seen in all the early marketing in the last couple of years, the tagline was, don't get too attached, as in most of these characters are probably going to die. I won't get into big spoilers in this video about who does wind up living and dying, but if you watch the trailers, you can make some pretty good guesses based on who shows up at the beginning of the trailer and who does not show up at the end of the trailers. That being said, there are still a few characters that are wearing some plot armor during this movie, like Harley Quinn, clearly because DC has plans for a lot more Harley Quinn movies. There's always going to be one or two characters that you're like, there's no way they're ever going to kill that person off. Even when Zack Snyder killed Superman off, everyone's like, they're definitely bringing Superman back. There's no way that that sticks. But James Gunn basically takes the Suicide Squad and does with them what he did with the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie, getting you to care about a bunch of really really despicable people, but the Suicide Squad movie is rated R, so it's just a much more hardcore WTF version of that. So this time, instead of getting you to care about a talking tree and a talking raccoon, it's a talking shark wearing pants and a giant weasel. And in the same way that Groot really did make Guardians of the Galaxy for a lot of people, King Shark is definitely one of the standout champs from this movie. Obviously, they're very different characters. The tone of Suicide Squad is very different from Guardians of the Galaxy, but it's the same type of energy there. Very down and dirty group of rogues. If you couldn't tell either, King Shark is voiced by Sylvester Stallone. Yes, he was Starhawk during the Guardians of the Galaxy 2. There are a couple of notable Marvel Guardians of the Galaxy actors that are in this movie. 
James Gunn's brother, Sean Gunn, plays the weasel character. The funny connection there is that yes, he does play Kraglin. You see his face on screen, but he's also the stand-in for Rocket Raccoon on set when they're filming. So he went from playing a tiny fur-covered creature to a giant one. Weasel is nothing like Rocket or Groot in the movie though. What you see from him in the trailers, like the jokes that they use him for, that's basically what you get from him. He's there to be super weird, kind of gross, and really, really hilarious. Overall, the movie just in general was plotted out and designed to feel like a Dirty Dozen type of war movie. There's no ring of garbage in the sky like the first movie. They successfully fixed a lot of the issues that people had with the main villains from that last Suicide Squad movie. Like I said though, true to form, everyone in this movie is a bad guy, so to speak. It's just that some of them are way, way worse. But most of them are criminals serving near life sentences for crimes against humanity. Like Bloodsport, for instance, Idris Elba's character is in prison for shooting Henry Cavill's Superman with a kryptonite bullet and putting him in critical condition. In the big roll call that you see at the beginning of the trailers when there are a billion different characters, yes, a couple of them are written to be douchebags on purpose, but like I said, don't get too attached. They have funny ways of dealing with the really, really terrible characters. Amanda Waller, if you've read any of her comic book stories, she's a really despicable character, but you do get where she's coming from. And she was pretty decent in the first Suicide Squad movie. I never had any issues with her portrayal or the way that they wrote her. So Viola Davis is fantastic as Amanda Waller in this new movie. She gives you exactly what you need from that character. Their literal big bad is Starro, as you've seen from all the trailers, but as funny as it sounds, they actually do a good job of humanizing him even though he is a giant starfish from outer space. You do sympathize with Starro, despite the fact that he is the original Justice League villain from their very first team up. I don't want to get into huge spoilers about what they're doing with him during the movie, but the idea is that as bad as he is, he is not the worst thing in the movie. One of the other big villains is Peter Capaldi's Thinker, who is a huge upgrade from the Flash TV show version of the Thinker for anyone that watched that season. As you can see, he's designed around the New 52 DeVoe version of the Thinker with the electrodes sticking out of his head. Peter Capaldi is an amazing actor, and even though most of you know him from Doctor Who, really, it feels like he's got more of his Malcolm Tucker energy in this from the thick of it. Just a really awful, really despicable character that you enjoy watching. There are so many huge actors in this movie, but they do a good job of utilizing them. Like I said, it's all in service of that tagline, don't get too attached, in the idea that Amanda Waller literally could care less about whether they live or die, only that eventually the mission is completed, so shotgun style, she just fires more and more bodies at a problem until it's solved. Nathan Fillion is hilarious as TDK. You've probably seen his powers detaching his limbs in all the trailers. I'm happy he finally made it into another James Gunn movie with his face visible. He did have a cameo scene in that first Guardians of the Galaxy movie as the voice of this creature. He was supposed to have a bunch of big cameo scenes in Guardians of the Galaxy 2, but they were cut for time. He's also technically the Wonder Man of the MCU as well. John Cena is hilarious in the most WTF way possible as Peacemaker. Exactly what he expect. He's been doing a bunch of comedy movies the last couple of years, so there's a lot of that energy, but because it's John Cena and it's an R-rated big war movie, they have so much fun having him just do so many, so many bad things. After seeing him in this movie as this character, I cannot wait to see that Peacemaker series that James Gunn and him are doing. Those episodes are supposed to start in January, so we'll probably get a trailer for that sometime after the movie comes out. I will be doing full episode videos for that. Idris Elba is great in all the stuff that he's done, so no big surprises that he tears it up as Bloodsport in this. He was sort of cast as a replacement for Will Smith's Deadshot when he declined to come back. They didn't want to recast Deadshot straight up, so that's why they made him Bloodsport in the movie. But as you can see from all the trailers, he's got a lot of Deadshot energy in this. Like they're both gun-themed sharpshooter villains, and they're both single dads trying to take care of their daughters, while at the same time being huge criminals. Margot Robbie's Harley Quinn is way more fun than she was in her own Birds of Prey movie. I feel like if you had a lot of problems with the Birds of Prey movie, this movie has a little more fun with her character in a little more traditional way. But there is no Joker that comes along for the ride with her. And the movie itself does not need the Joker at all to make itself better. So you will not miss the Joker during the events of this movie. But he is still alive. I know people will be asking all these Joker questions after they see the film. Like, what's going on with him? Where is he at? He's still out there somewhere. They haven't officially killed him off in the DCEU yet. Even though there are so many versions of the Joker now, you have to consider the Joaquin Phoenix Joker as if it's happening in an alternate universe. As you've seen too, there's a ton of smaller characters like C, D-list characters from the comics with really notable actors or other Marvel actors playing them, like Michael Rooker, who's playing Savant. He's great as always. The movie uses him in a kind of an unexpected way. 
David Dasmalshian from the Ant-Man movies you probably recognize as Polka Dot Man. He's every bit as weird as you would expect from the trailer scenes that they've released of him, but they do a good job of getting you to care about him. And I know a lot of you saw all the trailers and you were like, wait a minute, what are Pete Davidson and Flula Borg doing in this movie? Like, wait, what? What's going on here? Don't worry, there's a reason why their characters in particular seem like they're such huge douchebags. Like, Flula as a person is great. You may remember him from all of his YouTube videos, but he's playing Javelin, a Booster Gold character. Booster Gold, one of the biggest DC douchebags in the most hilarious way possible. So, of course, Javelin has a lot of the energy in him, too. The movie deals with both of their characters in really, really hilarious ways. I wasn't really familiar with Daniela Melchior before this movie. She's playing the second version of Rat Catcher from the comics. They're just calling her Rat Catcher 2, and the name is just a joke about those C and D list comic book characters where they were too lazy to create a more unique name, so they would just add like a number to the end of the original name, like two or three. She did a great job in this movie, even though her power's controlling an army of rats, and that seems kind of gross, in the same way James Gunn got you to care about the talking tree and the talking raccoon, it feels like there's nothing too gross or too weird that James Gunn can't get you to care about it. Just in general, I was happy with the way they ended the movie. They do wrap up most of the storylines from this movie in a good way, but also leave it in a way that allows for them to do sequels with another version of the team if James Gunn wants to come back and do another one. Like I said, there are two post credit scenes, so do stay after the credits. Just like Guardians of the Galaxy movies, one of them is a funnier one and the other one sets up the next big project. So if you have seen the movie, please do not post spoilers for the post credit scenes in the comments. I will do a full Easter eggs video, breakdown videos, post credit scene video after the official release date next week. Once you do have a chance to see it though, post all your movie reactions in the comments below. Just overall, it did feel like a really solid DC movie though. I've got a couple other new trailer videos from this week that I'm still working on and a new Marvel What If video that'll post tomorrow. You may have seen they just released a first look of Ben Affleck's Batman in the Flash movie. You can click here to watch that and click here for my brand new Marvel Shang-Chi trailer video and Easter eggs. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next video.